So I, I told Jill that I would try to give just a brief overview of the wheat research that we have going on in Vermont in collaboration mostly with the University of Maine and Ella Mallory and uh, try to do that in 15 minutes. Let's see here. So just a list of some of the collaborators. This is the short list because there's not a lot of room on the slide, but you know the primary folks working on these projects are Ellen Mallory who will be talking next, Rick Kurzbergen, Tom Malloy, Erica who just introduced me, Sid Bosworth, John Circle, a graduate student, and Susan Monhan, and there's many more folks as well, but uh, at least the research we'll be presenting today um, involves these folks. So um, a few years ago, the University of Maine, ARS, and the University of Vermont received a grant from the USDA Organic Research Initiative Project to focus on basically uh, enhancing New England farmers' ability to grow high quality wheat for the food grade market, particularly for bread wheat. I know, I'm carrying my shoe. <laughs> we put that under my arm and I'll put the clicker in my hand. All right, so in, in addition to OREI, we also have other funding sources that need to be mentioned because our wheat work started well before the OREI project, including Northeast Sarah has been a great funder, um, the Hatch program, other USDA grants, and then some other foundations have helped us um, get started. Mm -hmm. Down, up, down, sideways. It's okay. okay. Yes, please. All right, so, you know, some people might ask why we're trying to grow wheat in Vermont or Maine or any place, and really it just uh, really comes down to the fact that there's a buy local movement and there's a large demand for local foods, as everyone here probably knows as well. And this slide has gotten a lot of use for Vermont, but um, the direct sales of local food to consumers is the highest in Vermont, and you can see Maine, New Hampshire, and other New England states. Are right behind us. So this is really what's driving our research projects and really the, the interest of farmers too in actually starting to grow wheat again um, in Vermont and New England. Otherwise, really, you know, we can't compete with Kansas. Well, we probably can, but you know, we're not gonna try. We're not like that. We're really into <laughs> we are, but <laughs> anyway, only 15 minutes, no stories. Um, so <laughs> so the point is. The people want it, and the farmers want to deliver it, and the people want it from their local farmers, and that's what's really driving this project. All right, so when I first got started with this work, uh, I was just talking to the growers, really. And so our initial focus was really just on what the growers felt the production issues were. You know, and in spring wheat, the primary production issues were just getting it planted early enough. You know, that's, that's a problem for farmers. Weed control issues were problems. Um, they got lower yields in the spring, but they also got higher protein. And then in winter wheat, um, they liked winter wheat a little bit better. It was easier to get planted in the fall in a timely fashion. They got much better yields, but lower protein, um, and they didn't have as many wheat issues. So in the beginning, we were really just focused on what the farmers needed, which is what we're supposed to do. Next, please. And then the bakers. Um, we decided that we would maybe involve them in our conversation uh, because consumers wanted to buy bread and bakers did not uh, to buy bread that was produced with local wheat but bakers didn't want to bake bread with local wheat because as i think randy george said he could use the loaf of bread as a doorstop more than he could use it as a saleable product <laughs> and it was embarrassing and he didn't want he just didn't want to sell that kind of product and we thought it was a snob um, we didn't want to talk to him anymore. We thought he was really high maintenance and who do these bakers think they are? But as we got to know them and actually started involving them in the discussion, you know, we realized that they had some valid points. Um, and they also realized that the farmers had, had valid points. And so I guess um, the real point I'm trying to make is that we need to know what the end user wants too, not just what the farmers want, because then um, we're gonna have a product that people don't just buy because it's local, they buy it because it's really good high quality. So once we started to talk with the bakers, some other issues came up like the bread had this, uh, most of the wheat that was being purchased had really low falling numbers um, and that's what kind of turned it into a brick. And then um, we also were having some issues with mycotoxins. 
Um, and at the time when we started this project, actually farmers were not testing for mycotoxins, specifically Dawn, which can be harmful to humans and, and to animals too. Um, and then the bakers were saying, well, the protein levels are too low, and we're still, of course, dealing with weed pressure, winter survival, and all the other production issues that the farmers had. So I thought I would just, for those of you that don't know what falling number is, because this is one of the biggest challenges we have here in New England, although it hasn't been the last few years, so maybe it's not really a problem, um, is that the falling number is essentially a measurement of um, how much the wheat kernel has started to sprout. Okay, and so you can imagine, you know, a healthy wheat kernel that hasn't sprouted is full of starch, um, and, and you need that starch essentially for the bread to, to rise. Okay, um, and so as the kernel begins to sprout, it means it's starting to germinate. And everybody knows when the germination process starts, the starch starts to break down to feed the baby embryo. And so what that actually does is it degrades the quality of the wheat for baking. Okay, and so you can see two examples of a good falling number up on the top, nice and fluffy, air holes, and then on the bottom where it's nice and flat. Okay, so high fall good falling number versus poor one. So one of the things that we've been doing, um, keep me on time, Erica, and, and Ellen's gonna talk about some of the projects as well, but you know, the primary thing we needed to figure out with was what are the best varieties to grow in New England that are gonna meet all these quality demands as well as the high yields. And this, um, so what we've been doing is evaluating spring and winter wheat varieties in Maine and Vermont. And we've been looking at, you know, 25 to 30 different varieties from across the country, the northern part of the country. And I did put all the, you know, A, Bs, and Cs to show you statistical difference because there's way too many varieties and too many A, Bs, and Cs. So I just wanted to show you that, that really there, we have been seeing differences in varieties and falling number. So some varieties just have better falling numbers than others. Um, and, and that's based on their genetics. Some varieties have better resistance to um, uh, pre-harvest or sprouting. They don't sprout as much. Okay? And that's what we're trying to figure out because we do have sprouting issues in Vermont. So here's just a list of winter wheat varieties we've been trialing and sort of the top three for 2010 and the, and the bottom three for 2010. And just so you know, they actually were all above, pretty much above the acceptable level, which is about 250. Okay? And Erica, if you want to know more about this, Erica is the like, premier falling number <laughs> tester and she can tell you how it's all done. Too high can also be a problem. Yes, it can. Correct. Okay. So, um, so varieties can help farmers with a falling number. And another thing that we've been looking at is harvest date. Okay, so think about um, a kernel sprouting in the field. When is a kernel going to start to try to germinate? Okay, it becomes mature, and then you let it sit in the field to dry, right? Because a farmer doesn't want to harvest it too wet and have to pay to have it dry. And then it rains, and then it's humid, and then it gets dry again, and then it rains, and the kernel can become confused. <laughs> and, and say, well, I guess it's time for me to grow. No. Yep. Okay, so it'll start to um, try to germinate. And so what we've been looking at as a strategy is if we harvest earlier when the grain is, is wetter and get it out of the field quicker, will that help us improve falling number? Um, and so we've been looking at harvest dates for the last few years, and in some ways, unfortunately, we've had good weather during harvest, so we haven't seen really poor falling numbers. But you can see that the falling number does decline as you leave it in the field longer to dry because it's more prone to go through those weather fluctuations, the drying and the wetting. Next, please. Um, we've also been trying to look at strategies to deal with fusarium um, head blight and fusarium causes those mycotoxin issues, or can cause, so the fusarium produces mycotoxins called DAWN, and if the DAWN levels are over one part per million, people can get sick, and it produces a vomit toxin, <coughs> vomit is what happens. It's because pigs vomit if they eat it. Oh, really? Yes. And Ben Gleason did too. Oh, okay. Yeah, but so, <laughs> <laughs> and pigs. They have to be really hungry before they'll touch it. Though. Oh, really? And they're very susceptible to the, to the mycotoxin. 
So um, we did some uh, uh, projects where we put these little cages out on farms and there were different cropping systems and such. And you can see that cropping system really impacts the amount of fusarium that we'll see in wheat. And you can see right away that if you follow wheat with a broadleaf versus a grain, there's less of a chance for um, mycotoxin development or fusarium infection. So we're continuing work in this area. Um, and then again, looking at varieties. And there is a huge difference in varieties. There's no true resistance or full resistance to fusarium, but there's tolerance um, to it. And some varieties are more tolerant than others. And uh, one of the best varieties that we've been seeing in both quality and um, resistance to Dawn is Redeemer. And farmers and bakers really, well, farmers don't like it that much, but the bakers do. Um, we control, again, another issue, and we've been, um, John Zirkel, who's just finishing his master's, so we'll have uh, a, a bigger report for you all later, is looking at interseeding as a means to control weeds, um, also a means, we, we weren't sure if it actually impacted dawn levels, because it would keep the, the area maybe more moist, okay? Um, and we haven't seen any increase in dawn from interseeding, we've seen a decline in weeds, and some impact on yields though. So she can't go back, but that's okay. And I'm out of time. Um, and then we've also been lo looking at planting dates. We did start three minutes late. Yes, yes. okay. <laughs> All right, um, so just interseeding uh, is mostly a good thing, but we are seeing differences between red clover and white clover, where red clover with a deeper tap root seems to maybe compete actually with the wheat more than the shallow rooted uh, white clover. Okay, planting dates, we've been looking at spring wheat planting dates and variety. Remember, weeds are um, an issue in spring wheat, and part of that issue is because wheat gets planted often too late, um, and it doesn't get growing before the weeds get growing. And so you can just see a photograph here from wheat planted in April versus wheat planted at the end of May, and that's looking down at the wheat, and you can see no weeds in one, and a bunch of grass and weeds in the other. So planting date does make a difference. Um, and this is some data, and you can see how poor our wheat yields were this year, but I think everybody's yields were, were pretty poor. But um, if you look in the yield column, you can see that planting earlier gives us better yields, you know, twice as much um, in some cases. Uh, the interesting thing is it, it does seem like maybe the protein might go up as the planting date is delayed, uh, maybe because the, the ground is warmer when the plant needs more nitrogen, and so there's, this is organic systems again, so there might be a, 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 it might, the nitrogen in the soil might, the organic nitrogen might be being released at the proper time, maybe because the soil's warmer, I'm not sure. Um, and again, we do see a slight decline in falling number, um, and dawn seems to be higher in the beginning of the season, but I'm not sure if that trend's gonna hold true. Same harvest date? Uh, they were slightly different, okay. yeah. All right, see, this is why I didn't do A's, B's, and C's before. But um, the other thing, again, just looking at varieties, picking the right varieties, very, very important. And you can see that there's been a, there's a, a pretty significant difference in protein amongst these varieties. So if we can start our growers out by selecting just the right variety, we're going to make a, a lot of headway in producing high-quality wheat and then helping them um, manage other practices such as fertility and weed control is going to help as well. And uh, we also are looking at yields, if you go to the next slide, Erica. And, um, you know, there does, there's not really much of a, <laughs> we don't see any one, okay, one thing that we do see is that wheat from Washington State doesn't generally do well in New England. That's probably the, the most solid trend that we see, but we do see that maybe wheat from North Dakota um, and New York and wheat from Quebec and, and wherever, Ontario, they all seem, you know, depending on the variety, to perform okay in New England. So we keep evaluating those varieties. Um, tell me if I'm out of time. Really? Okay, so an another thing that we've been doing is a lot of our producers are interested in heirloom wheats. Uh, maybe a, uh, some of its market potential, having something different um, and, and niche to market to their, uh, 
to the bakers and also to consumers. And also, you know, there's this thought that uh, heirloom wheat tastes better and also is in as higher nutritional value. And I will tell you that it doesn't all taste better. We do know that for certain. There is a reason why some of them were left behind. <laughs> okay, so this is just a, a list of, um, and Erica put this together, of, of the heirloom wheats we've been trialing in Vermont. These are all spring wheats. And there's uh, three wheats on here, you can't see the bottom ones, that were actually developed and released in Vermont in the 1800s. And so we've definitely wanted to trial those and try to bring those back into production in Vermont. And again, you can see there's definitely a difference in yields amongst these varieties. They're all spring wheat varieties. What's really exciting to us is that Champlain, which is a Vermont variety, has performed very well for us. Um, and this other variety called Ladoga, which is uh, 1916, I think it was released um, from Russia, and it's an excellent variety. It commonly outperforms all of the uh, modern day varieties in our spring wheat trials. It, um, it's tall, it competes with weeds well, and it has good standability and high yields. And it also won the taste test in our heirloom wheat uh, bake-off. Right, Erica? Probably because I told everybody it was the best. But anyway, so, <laughs> you know. And AC Berry, you can see sort of in the middle there, that's a standard spring wheat that a lot of our growers grow. So you can see that some of the heirlooms um, outperform the standard that they're using today. And then uh, we have been working with consumers as well, and this was the heirloom uh, wheat bread tasting that we did at the local uh, food co-op and giving people an opportunity to taste bread that was baked with wheat that probably hasn't had bread baked with it for since 1960. So it was a, they didn't understand how special it was, but I did. I think I cried a little bit that day. Okay. Took us how many years to get enough wheat to make a loaf of bread? <laughs> right, Erica. So uh, just to finish up, all of our reports um, are on these three websites. Uh, we have our crop and soil website that um, Erica and, and I manage, as well as my other team members. And then we also have the Northern New England Bread Wheat site that Ellen's been managing with some great videos on it and reports as well. And then if you're interested, we do have a Northern Grain Growers Association that is um, housed in Vermont. But the benefit of joining is that we have a cereal grain testing lab open now um, that tests wheat quality. And if you're a member, you get a discount. Um, so, and we also have a newsletter that I think is fun and informational. So that's it. Thank you.